Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon. And then I'm doing a bunch of videos now throughout the week. So, you know, if you're subscribed, click subscribe, uh, hit the bell, all that sort of good stuff. Um, get notifications because I know I'm doing videos throughout the week, but they're they're canned. The ones are canned the rest of the week because I don't have time to deal with chats and things like that because John and I both work. So I'd like to thank my sponsor, BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P, BetterHelp dot com slash Chris Godinas. They're an online therapy company. They are international. They are awesome. They are helping my clients find a therapist for their friends. So that is good. That makes me very happy because I'm booked. So um, anyway, the point being better help, betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas, online therapy company. Awesome. Good, good feedback from the people using them. Um, I highly recommend them. So there that is. Okay. All right. Hello. Hello, everybody. I literally, literally half an hour ago flew in from Tampa and boy, are my arms tired. No, seriously. <laughs> um, Tampa was awesome. I had so much fun. My ladies, thank you so much. It was so much fun. It was awesome. Next time I promise when I come out, I will stay a little longer so we can chat a little longer. And it was awesome because we had a really good time and it was great seeing you guys. So Yay! That was awesome. I, I I love doing the meet and greets, guys. I really do. It's so fun to meet you guys and talk to you and hear your stories and help you with whatever, you know, things are keeping you stuck, that kind of thing. So anyway, hello, everybody. Hello. So Tampa was great. That was awesome. Now we are putting the other um, meet and greets on hold for just this weekend because we're reworking the schedule because John and I are trying to figure out how to make it work so that we're not backtracking. So we're going to have a nice smooth schedule going out because we're going to be going to the East Coast. So uh, if you're on the East Coast in Virginia, especially, we will be putting up dates there. So anywhere in that area, um, I am bringing the pups with me this time. I know I said that last time, but this time it's actually going to happen. So um, there is that. Um, Okay. Oh, I am glad I could help you. Thank you. And 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 thank you. And, and I'm glad I could help. Um, okay. So did that, did that. Meet and greets are on hold for just a second until we figure out the schedule. We'll get that ironed out by next weekend. And the next weekend, I'll have a whole list of dates to announce so we know what we're doing. Um, okay. There was that. So Tampa was amazing. Loved it. A aside from the meet and greet, it's first of all, it's the ocean. Hello, Pisces. Cannot go wrong. Ocean, me, ocean, me, good thing. So food was amazing. It was fantastic. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you? It was just pretty. It was just, Tampa's a really pretty little, well, little, it's not that little, but a pretty town. It was just really, we were right there, or I was right there on the canals and stuff. And it was just, I liked it. <laughs> I just like, it was so funny. My friend Marianne, who lives on the other side of Florida, she came over and and, and drove over to, to see me and we were, you know, walking around and everything. She's like, Oh my God, it's so humid. And I'm like, oh, I know, isn't it wonderful? Cause I live here in the desert and it's like literally, you know, eight, 9% humidity. And over there it was like 90% humidity. And I'm just like, I love the humidity. She's like, I hate the humidity. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's too funny. Anyway, I'm really tired. I'm hyped up on caffeine. I've had about four hours of sleep. So I apologize. All right. Current events. So as I was flying back, I was listening to the AP news or reading the AP news. And I came across this article, Romanian guru suspected of running international sex sect handed preliminary charges, charges with 14 others. So this 71 year old Romanian yoga guru and 14 others were handed preliminary charges by a Paris magistrate on a raft of counts, including, um, uh, it, including linked to, okay, counts linked to an international sex ring that for years allegedly subjected followers seeking enlightenment to sexual exploitation. Um, Gregorian Bivlara, B Bivolaru was among two of the six handed a string of preliminary charges that included human trafficking in an organized band, kidnapping, sequest sequestration, or arbitrary detention of numerous people along with rape and abusing the weakness of a group via psychological and physical subjection. None of the 15 was named, but a judicial source that said that Bivolaru was among the two facing the longest list of charges. So basically it was a cult, what I gathered from reading 
this article. You can find it on the AP. Um, and he did describing how he manipulated, controlled, uh, it coerced, intimidated. It, it very much describes a communal narcissist. So I thought that was really interesting. And of course, he's claiming that, you know, oh, this is a witch hunt and I'm innocent and all of that. And they always do. Um, but he had been alleged to sexual abuses spanned Europe. In 2017, Finland's National Bureau of Investigation issued an international arrest warrant for him. So this has been going on for years. So, you know, saying that one person is making it up, okay, sure. But you've got a huge amount of people coming forward going, no, this person sexually attacked me, sexually assaulted me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, here's my, here's my favorite saying, once is a fluke, twice is a coincidence, three or more is a pattern of behavior. Believe the behavior. So when somebody, you know, when somebody has these charges on them, and it's just one person saying that, you can kind of be like, okay, maybe, maybe not. But then when it's like this person and this person and this person and this person and this person, and this person mm, no, you've got a pattern of behavior. So, and, and it's, that's the same thing that happened with, um, oh, who was that creepy producer guy? Brain gone. The one in Hollywood that blacklisted Ashley Judd. John, can you help me on that one? What's that? Who is the creepy producer guy? with all the sexual abuse charges. Who? Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, it's the same thing. So it's like one person comes out, nobody says anything, nobody, you know, so you're just kind of like, well, maybe, maybe not. But then all of these people started coming forward. Thank you, Weinstein. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, and they start coming forward and you're just like, okay, this is no, this is, this is not a fluke. This is not a coincidence. This is a pattern of behavior. So I want you guys to be very, very careful when you go looking for enlightenment, because a lot of us do when we come out of these relationships, because a lot of these so-called gurus, they need, need, not just want, they need a harem. They need adulation. They need all of these people to feed their ego 24 freaking seven. And so they hide themselves as a spiritual guru, a yoga guru, a Buddhist guru, a Christian guru, a whatever, you know, they basically wrap themselves in whatever dogma or religion or enlightenment thing. And they claim that they are, they are the way in the light. Anybody who does that guys, anybody who does that run, do not walk to the nearest exit because you can be assured that you are dealing with a covert narcissist, a communal narcissist. So someone who passes themselves, Nexium, Twin Flames. Yeah. Oh my God. If you guys have not watched the documentary on Twin Flames, holy shamomo, guys. Seriously, mind, it was terrifying. Terrifying. It's the same thing with that other um, documentary that I was recommending in the deep, Into the Deep. Uh, about Teal Swan, it just, whoo, whoa, scary. So be careful of anyone who claims they are the sole way and they are the light and you have to follow them. And especially if they start wanting sexual favors, which in the history of never has that ever had anything to do with enlightenment. So don't get me started. Anyway, um, so yeah, so there was that. All right. Let's dive into the topic because I'm afraid I am running on very low battery power here. My computer's fine. My brain is totally gone at this point. I am so tired. Um, okay, so today we are talking about that lost feeling. So what the heck? So we come out of an abusive relationship, any kind of abusive relationship, whether that's parental, you know, our parents were abusive or romantic or a boss situation or a coworker situation or a friend situation. We come out of it. The blinders are off. We can see clear. We can see clearly now the fog is gone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Fog, fear, obligation, guilt. So that is gone. And now we can see everything, right? So yeah, granted, on the one hand, it's kind of like, whoa, I can see stuff. And on the other hand, it's like, I have no clue who I am now. I know. 
I know that. That's what we do. So when we get involved with a narcissist, either romantically or because it's the family or whatever, narcissists love to tell us who we are all the time. So a great example of a parental narcissist is, okay, little kid is in the grocery store. Little kid wants, you know, candy or something. So a healthy parent would say, well, honey, I know you want it but we're not going to get it right now. And I know you're disappointed and I know you don't like it. And life is not fair. So if we have money next time, we'll get it. If we have money next time, you know? So that's being truthful, authentic, real with the kid. You're not denying that the kid wants it. Now, what a narcissist parent will do is they'll go, you don't want that. Um, Au contraire, biatch, I think the kid does. So they deny the kid's reality. So good evening and welcome to your first taste of gaslighting at age two. So they gaslight their kids. No, you don't want that. Yeah, I do. No, you don't. Uh, okay, I guess I don't. And that causes the kid to start doubting themselves. Here is a classic example of conditioning. They're conditioning us, okay? to start doubting ourselves. And this is why when we come out of an abusive relationship, okay, that's an example of a familial one. We don't know what we want. Seriously, the abusers love to tell us whether they are family or whether they are a romantic partner. Up is down, black is white, green is yellow, uh, you know, left is right, and you're wrong. <laughs> that's just what they do. So they get us to start doubting ourselves with all of the gas lighting, all of the lying, all of the rewriting history, all of the denying our own emotions. So let me give you an example of one in a relationship. They do something heinous, right? They hurt our feelings. They trample on our boundaries. They say something inappropriate or do something inappropriate and we call them on it. What do they do? Same thing that the, the parental narcissist does. Well, you're too sensitive. How dare you? You're wrong. You're perceiving it wrong. Um, excuse me, if I could throw middle fingers right now, uh, I would. So that's what they're doing. They're gaslighting. They're saying you don't have a right to your emotion. You don't have a right to feel hurt. You don't have a right to be angry. You know, my, my one of my dad's favorite things, oh my God, and we were talking about this this weekend. One of my dad's favorite things to do would be to rewrite history and or if he got caught, you know, red handed with his hand in the cookie jar, he would hit us or he would say something like, don't you be angry at me. I'll give you something to be angry about. Or don't you cry. I'll give you something to cry about. And I'm sitting here thinking in my head, mother clucker, I have got plenty to be angry about and plenty to cry about. So they deny our reality so that their little ego is safe and happy whatever the frick that is for them. Anyway, the point being is they gaslight. They gaslight, they lie, they deny. You know, they tell you you're too sensitive. There's no such thing, guys. There is no, I swear to God and all that is holy. I swear on everything that's holy. If somebody comes to you and says, you're too sensitive, run, do not walk to the nearest exit. If they tell you that you're overly emotional, Run. Do not walk to the nearest exit. Here's the deal. When little kids are having big emotions, right? A healthy parent will call it. Sweetie, you're having a really big emotion and you don't know what to do with it. And that's okay. And it's amazing how those kids kind of go, uh-huh. And then you comfort them, right? What an abuser does is you're having a big emotion. I'm uncomfortable with it because I'm operating on the level of a two-year-old, if that, on a good day, if the wind's blowing in the right direction on a Tuesday. So I'm going to make you bad and wrong for having a normal reaction to freaking abuse. <laughs> yeah. So instead of going, wow, I see your emotion. It is a big emotion. You're not sure how to deal with it. I hear you because they can't because they have no empathy. Did I mention that? They make you wrong. Parental units that are narcissistic do the same thing. Instead of validating the kid and going, yes, you're having a big emotion. I, I hear you. I see you. Because that was the big thing we talked about this weekend. A lot of survivors have got throat problems 
like sore throats all the time or, you know, raspy voices, can't talk, you know, the, 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 the freeze sets in and you freeze instead of being able to confront your abuser because we've been told over and over and over again, your voice does not matter. Again, if I could be throwing middle fingers right now, I would. So it's, important for us to speak up. It absolutely is. And one thing that I see that survivors have a really hard time with is being angry at the abuser. Guess what, guys? It's okay. I give you permission. I absolve you. I give you permission. You can yell every four-lettered word you need to, not at them because it wouldn't do any good, but write it down. Write, dear abuser, bleep the bleepity bleep bleep out of bleeping bleep you, you bleeping loser, bleep 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 bleep. Like I said, one time I had 27 pages, very tiny writing. Bleep you, bleep you, bleep you, bleep you, bleep you, bleep you. That would that lot of anger. So it's okay to be angry, guys. They've harmed us. Anger is a good emotion. It lets us know where we've been hurt. Because remember, anger is a bodyguard. Bodyguard, bodyguard, bodyguard. I'm losing it. I really need to go to sleep. Of the softer emotions, you know, hurt, sadness, fear. Boom. So when you're angry, you got to figure out which one of those are you really feeling. Back to the lost feeling. So they love to tell us who we are. Well, that emotion's wrong. You can't have it. Okay. Well, what emotion can I have? None, really. Even if you're happy, whoo, if you're happy, they'll come in and ruin it. I cannot tell you the number of times my father would walk into a family dinner, sit down at the table, everybody's conversing, having a good time talking, and he will say or do something that ruins it because they cannot stand when somebody's happy. Pisses them off. No end because they can't feel it. And if they can't feel it, nobody can feel it. That's literally the way they think. Seriously. So they will ruin happy situations every time. That's why they ruin birthdays, anniversaries, uh, weddings, funerals, believe it or not. Um, you know, job interviews, uh, you know, things that should be happy or looked forward to or, you know, whatever. No, they'll ruin it because they can't feel it. And if it's not about them, how dare you? That's really their motto for life is how dare you? Really? <laughs> There's a there's a singer. Her name is Shia Danny. She cracks me up. She's also a comedian and she's hysterically funny. She's got the most beautiful voice ever. So she does these series of like cooking videos, right? You know, she's cooking at home and things like that. She has the big hat and everything. And so when the hat gets in the way, she always goes, how dare you? And I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> that is so funny because that's what a narcissist would do. So Anyway, that that literally, you know, is their mantra is how dare you have an emotion? How dare you feel? How dare you think? How dare you want something? So the other thing that came up is when when we try to do something for ourselves, what does the abuser do? They take it over or they demand that we do it for them too, or we, they demand that we give up taking care of ourselves in order to make them happy and give them whatever they want. So there's no, yes, good, take care of yourself. It's always, how dare you? How dare you take care of yourself? How dare you spend money on yourself? You should be spending that money on me. That's literally their attitude. So they literally tell us what to think, what to wear, how to cut our hair in some cases they do, uh, what we like, what we don't like. The other thing that abusers cannot stand is people that have an actual opinion and a brain. So if somebody has got two brain cells to rub together and has an actual opinion that's different from theirs, oh my God, just, oh my God, they will come unfreaking hinged. They can't stand it. They'll, well, no, you think this brainwashing. Okay. If you're with somebody, parental unit, romantic partner, boss, whatever, that's constantly telling you you're wrong and then constantly going, no, you think this, eventually that little kid inside of you, that inner child is going to go, uh, okay, I guess I think this. So that when we leave that relationship and you don't have that fog constantly messing with your brain and that cognitive dissonance constantly going on, we literally don't know who we are. Seriously, I'm not kidding you. So guys, if you're feeling lost, if you're coming out of the relationship and you're going, wow, I used to have such a great sense of humor and I just don't feel like I have a sense of humor. It's not okay to laugh or, wow, I, 
I don't even know what I want for dinner. Are these clothes okay? I, who am I? Totally normal. Totally normal. Because we've been harangued, intimidated, punished, yelled at, screamed at, guilt tripped, uh, you name it, they've done it to make us conform to what they want. They literally cannot stand differing opinions. If you have a differing opinion, they will shut you up. They will punish you. They will tell you to shut up in some cases. That's why a lot of us have that whole throat thing about, ooh, it's not safe to talk or it's not safe to express anger or it's not safe to express anything or it's not safe to have a want or a need. I'm here to tell you it is. It is safe. It is okay. You stand up to those abusers and you get away from them and no is your savior word. Seriously, it is a complete sentence, does not need an explanation. You have the right to have your own emotions. You have the right to have your own voice. You have the right to be heard. You have the right to be believed. You have the right to do self-care. Oh, that was the other thing. So a lot of people conflate self-care with being a narcissist because the narcissist is always going, oh, well, I need to care for myself. I have to take care of me. I, 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 oh, blow it out your nose. Anyway, so they're doing that whole, oh, it's all about me. I get to take care of myself. Me, 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 me. I, 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 more my genitals. That's really how they think. So when we start doing self-care, it feels selfish to us. Ooh, turn off the sound. <laughs> there we go. Um, it feels selfish to us. It does because we're like, oh, I've never been allowed to like do anything for myself. That must mean I'm a horrible person. No. Self-care, my loves, is self-esteem. It is. Glenn Schiraldi, the self-esteem workbook. Read it. I'm not, I'm telling you this for a reason. I'm not just, you're not going to get it by osmosis. Um, self-esteem. That would be great. If I could do that, if you could do that, that'd be great. I could retire. I could own a b and somewhere and make breakfast for people. That would be my dream. Anyway, the point being, I'm so tired. So much caffeine. So tired. Anyway, the point being is self-care is self-esteem. It is. So let me just give you the difference between the two. And this is why we get confused. This is why we don't know who we are is because the narcissist has convinced us that when we care for ourselves, we're being selfish. How many times have we heard that? Raise your hand. Hello. Yep. So when we do something for ourselves, they convince us that we're being selfish. We're not. It is self-care. It is self-esteem. Okay. So narcissists get other esteem. So they yell to the world, tell me how great I am. That's what they do. Tell me how great I am. Tell me how great I am. I'm great. I'm great. I'm the greatest ever. Uh, 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 uh. Tell me how great I am. And they need, that's why they need harems. That's why they need cults to follow them, to tell them how great they are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so yeah. So esteem, self-esteem is just that little tiny voice inside your head that goes, Hey, Hi, I like you. Yep, you're a good person. Yep. Oops, you screwed up. Okay, uh, fix that, make amends. Okay, good, you did. Okay, fabulous, and move on. And I still like you. So even though you screwed up, I still like you. Good job, keep going. That's self-esteem, that is it. Which is why I want you guys to do mirror work, mirror work, mirror work, mirror work, mirror work, mirror work. Because you are talking to that inner child. You are reinforcing you're the good parent now. Hi, good to see you. Have a great day. You know what? It's okay to have your own opinion. Mm -hmm. It's okay to like what you like. And you don't have to like what your abuser liked. It's okay. And then walk out the door. Seriously. So that's what the self-esteem work is. That is what the mirror work is, is to get you to start remembering who you really are, who you were before the abuser. Absolutely. Or... In some of our cases, if we had families of origin that were just hose beasts, we never knew who we were. We were never allowed to be who we were. Let me give you a great example. <clears throat> Again, my father, mm -hmm, poster child for how not to be a parent. So he loved opera. Okay, now listen, I, I do like some opera, like Madame Butterfly is really pretty. I hate the storylines though, because basically everybody dies and sings as they're dying. And I just don't like the storylines. So, but the music is pretty, right? So I'll listen to some of it, but he would insist that that's all we listen to. 
So the day I came home, realize this is back in the 70s, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. When I came home with a John Denver album, you would have thought that I joined the Communist Party. Seriously. Came unglued, would not let me sit and listen to it. Wouldn't let me listen to it. Like every time I tried to, even if I put it on in my room with the doors closed, had it on super low, he'd come barging in and tell me how horrible John Denver was. And then he would put on his opera music and blast it and insist that we appreciated the, the finer arts, et cetera. Oh, good God. Anyway, so there's a, there's a prime example of you cannot have your own opinion. Now, thankfully, I was, you know, what, 10 years old when that happened, eight years old, something like that. Um, and I had an older sister that encouraged me to listen to my own music. So that was very, very helpful. So in that situation, having a second mom was a good thing because my older sister, Terry, was totally able to, you know, hey, kiddo, Paul, let me introduce you to the Beatles, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, and so I, I started listening to rock and roll music and all of this stuff. Yeah, he would not allow us to listen to our own music and he made us wrong for it. You know, he wouldn't even be like, well, it's not my kind of music, but you go ahead and listen to it. It's like, look, guys, I usually love every single kind of music. There's only two kinds of music I kind of have a problem with. One is the really nasty rap songs where they're calling women all sorts of names. I don't like that. And the other one is the really twangy country. I like a lot of country, but I don't like the twangy ones where they're like, I lost my car, my pickup, my dog, my horse. I'm just like, oh, stop it. Stop being a victim. Anyway, so um, yeah, there's there's that. That's the only two types of music I'm not crazy about. But if somebody wants to listen to it, I am happy to listen to it with them because maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I'm not seeing what they're seeing. I'd like to step into their shoes and see what they're seeing. Narcissists cannot do that. They cannot step into somebody's shoes and allow themselves to go, oh, I dig it. I, I get why you like this. Okay. They have to make them wrong. They have to call them names. They have to put them down. They have to try to make them feel stupid. They have to, you know, fill in the blank. So this is what narcissists do. This is why when we come out of those relationships, we literally don't know who we are. I've literally had people sit on my couch and go, I'm away from the parents. I got out of the abusive relationship that was romantic. I don't even know what kind of food I like. Yeah, that's how much they get into our head and just take that egg beater and go... So that if we do find ourselves liking something that they don't like, guess what? We feel guilty. I cannot tell you the number of clients I have had that have gotten out of the relationships, gotten rid of the parental units, gotten rid of all the, the romantic stuff. They're away. They're happy. They're on their own. And they will be like, I feel so guilty for feeling good. That breaks my heart. It makes me angry <sighs> because it's like, it's not fair and it's not right. And this is what these jack wagons, and you know what I'm saying, do to us. They make it so that we feel guilty for self-care. We feel guilty for feeling good. We feel bad and wrong for having a big emotion. Guess what? Guys, we're human. We're going to have big emotions. And if other people can't handle it, that's their effing problem. Ugh, it just, ugh, it just makes me angry. So, so yeah. So basically you want to stay the hell away from anyone who tells you that you can't have your own opinion, uh, that you don't know what you want when you do, you know, just like that mom saying, oh no, you don't want that. Well, yeah, the kid does want that. Don't do that to that kid. That kid is going to need to know who they are in this world because narcissists are only too happy to tell us who we are. So Anyone who doesn't validate your emotions, anyone who tells you you're overly sensitive, oh, go blow it out your ear. You know, anyone who tells you that uh, crying is wrong or being sad is wrong or angry is wrong, none of it is wrong, guys. We have a right to our own emotions. We have a right to our own opinions. Okay? We don't have to fight with somebody over it. See, this is what I see wrong in this world a lot. The people who get all huffy when somebody has a differing opinion, whether it's political or religious or anything else and who want to shut them down and tell them they're stupid and, you know, call them names and this, that, and the other thing. I sit there and I go, mm -hmm, you just showed me everything I need to know about you and your upbringing. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder what kind of family dynamics that was. Do you see where I'm going with that? And so you want to avoid people that cannot walk a mile in your shoes. 
seriously. It's all about the compassion, guys. And it does take a village to help this entire planet. It really does. You can't, there is no us and them. There's one freaking planet. Figure it the frick out and get along. Jesus, criminy. Anyway, sorry, just tired, caffeine. So the point being is walk in somebody else's shoes. Compassion, not idiot compassion. You know, it's like, okay, I dig where you're coming from, but I don't need to fix you. You know, that's compassion. But walking in their shoes and going, I dig why you're thinking that way. Okay, well, how can we how can we come to a mutually agreeable situation? That's really what it's all about. But when you're dealing with egos, there is no mutually agreeable situation because they have to win at all costs. And I do mean all costs. And furthermore, they would rather see us dead than to have a peaceful solution. Take that politically, religiously, interpersonally, you name it. Narcissists want us dead. They don't want to lose. And in order to win, we have to be mini-me's to them, which is why when we come out of a, an abusive relationship, we don't know our a-hole from a hole in the ground. We really don't. It's like, oh my God, I used to be happy. I, I used to like doing X, Y, and Z, and I don't even know if I like that. What do I like? Who am I? Seriously. So those kind of existential questions is absolutely what's going to happen. So it's finding meaning in our life, okay? Which is why I encourage you guys to write. Write, write, write. If you want to publish, publish. Of course, change all the names so you don't get sued. But I think it's helpful for other survivors to write their own stories and publish them so that other survivors can go, oh crap, I'm not alone in this. I'm not the only one. I'm not the lone voice in the wilderness. Do you see where I'm going with that? Normalization is huge. And when we get normalization and we get, you know, you're not alone, that makes it less acceptable for those types of people to flourish that are, that are the abusers. Does that make sense? So publish, write, do poetry, do songs, do art. Art would be great, you know, whatever medium you like. So anyway, the point being is there's a reason why we feel lost. So for example, narcissists very much are attracted to people that have something that they don't have, okay? So if somebody's got a great sense of humor, the narcissist is going to be attracted to them because they don't have that. Their sense of humor is usually very snarky, snide, uh, mean, cruel, sarcastic, sardonic, you know, that whole thing. So they'll get with somebody who's got a good nature, a good sense of humor. And by the end of the relationship, that person will be like, I don't even think I'm funny. I don't even think I can laugh. I don't even think, and you'll feel guilty for doing it because this person will have taken it away from you. That is their whole goal. It is a game of keep away, keep away. Anything that's real and authentic and awesome that makes you, you, and they're happy as a clam. You start getting you back, they're angry as all get out. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. So that's why we feel lost. That's why when we come out of that relationship, we're just like, I don't even know who I am. What the heck? So in order to work on that, you need to get with a damn good trauma therapist. This is why you need a therapist. And next week, we're going to talk about doing it alone, white knuckling it versus having an accountability partner, which is a therapist, that's going to help you. So get with a good trauma therapist, okay? And I'm going to talk about what to look for and all that sort of good stuff. But we're going to talk about also the differences between working alone and getting with a good therapist. Okay, so get with a good trauma therapist. Work on CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. That's going to help you a lot. Get the self-esteem workbook. Mm -hmm. I have an older version of it here. I think it's white now. Uh, by Glenn Schiraldi. Okay. Awesome book. Work it front to back. And when you're done, go back and work it again. And when you're done, go back and work it again. I'm not kidding you. Do it. Um, okay. Self-esteem workbook. Uh, Diseased Please by Harriet Breaker or any book on codependency. PM Melody has some really good books on codependency. Uh, Melanie Beattie. Um, and give yourself permission in the mirror. So when you're doing mirror work, hi, good to see you. Have a great day. You know what? It's okay for you to have your own opinion and walk out. That's, that's your affirmation for the day. And you do that for a whole month. Seriously. 
because you need to retrain your brain. Those idiots, those abusers, and if I could use four-lettered words, I would, are sitting there brainwashing you, telling you lies. La, 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 la. If their lips are moving, they're lying, okay? And they're filling your head full of crap, okay? And that little kid inside is believing it. This is who you're having to heal, is the inner child. Inner Child Workbook by Katherine Taylor. What did I do with it? It was sitting on my desk and I have no idea where it is. Anyway, so Inner Child work, Workbook, either by Katherine Taylor or the one by Lucia Cappuccioni, and she's gotten a bunch of them on it. Um, so do that. Start comforting your inner child, talking to your inner child. Hey, you know what? All the lies that my abuser said, they were lying. Yeah, it's not true. I have a right to an opinion. I have a right to like myself. You say that in the mirror. You're reinforcing that. You're retraining your brain. You're undoing the damage that the idiots did. And you're putting in the good stuff. So you're also going to be having to do thought stopping. So when those thoughts pop up about, oh, I'm selfish and this and that. No, mm -mm, stop. Uh-uh, mother clucker. I see you. I hear you. You are not allowed in. I hear you knocking, biatch. You cannot come in. You're a liar. I am am worth my own love. I am worth my own time. I am worth my own self-esteem. It is okay for me to like myself. You can saw it off. See where I'm going with that? Write and burn, write and burn, write and burn, write and burn. All the lies that they told you, challenge them. Replace them with the positive. And at the end of the letter, you know what? I am kicking you out of my head. You don't get to live in my head one more GD second. I'm evicting you. Don't you ever show up here again, you son of a... Mm. And take your power back. And then, goodbye. I'm done with you. I wash my hands. Oh, you foul being. You know what I'm saying? Trot it out to the barbecue. Read it out loud once. Burn it. Let the words go with the smoke. Heaven or hell. Wherever. Probably hell. But, you know, there it is. Okay. So there's my rant for this morning. Okay, I'm going to hit the questions and then I am going to probably go to bed after this because so, <laughs> I'm so tired. I did have so much fun in Tampa though, guys. It was great. It was I really enjoyed it. Okay, question. Do female narcissists hate other females more than they hate men? Oh, yes. I, I, in some cases, yes, absolutely. So let me answer that part first. I'll get to the second half in just a second. So female narcissists hate everybody. Let's be clear. Male narcissists hate everybody. Do they hate one more than the other? Sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it has to do with their upbringing, who is the difficult parent in their life and what was going on and all that sort of good stuff. I have seen narcissists be misogynistic. I have seen them be, oh, what's the word for hating men? Shoot, brain gone. Anyway, they hate men. Um, and, but female narcissists tend to be in competition like nobody business with their daughters. Like crazy, like crazy. So I have seen female narcissists punish their daughters for being beautiful, uh, refuse to let them do their hair the way they want to, wear makeup, go out. Um, they will flirt with their boyfriends and be angry when the boyfriends do not reciprocate. Uh, they will, um, you know, sabotage them. They'll, you know, because nobody can do better than the narcissist. Let's be clear. So the narcissist is in competition with literally everybody and especially their own daughters. Oh, absolutely. I have heard stories of them dragging them across the floor by their hair, forcing them to cut their long, beautiful hair off because they got too many compliments and they needed to keep them humble. I, You know, I hear stories like that. It's a good thing I have some acting training because when I hear stories like that, I have to really take a breath and not really respond because what I want to do is, oh my God, what the frick is wrong with that biatch? You know, that's what I'd like to say, but I can't. So, you know, I mean, who, who does that? Well, an abuser, a psychopath, a absolute flaming psychopath. That, because, oh, geez, Louise. Okay. If I had kids, I've got plenty of great nieces and great nephews and things like that. If they get compliments, I'm thrilled. It's like, good genes. Yeah. Huzzah. You look great. You know, I'm happy for them, but narcissists cannot be happy for anybody else. And if their daughter gets a compliment, they view that as a threat. It, 
hello, can you say dysfunctional with a capital D? They put the fun and dysfunction. Yeah, I mean, it's like, what the frick? So they'll they'll physically torture their children. They'll ignore they'll, their children. Um, they will parade them out when it's convenient for them uh, with, with female narcissists. If they're in competition with the girl, oh yeah, they are vicious. They're hateful. It's like mean girls in high school, except it's your mother. What the frick? Do you see where I'm going with that? So yeah, they can be absolutely hundred percent. And if they hate men, they do the same thing to the kid, the boy kids. They'll, you know, beat them up or ignore them or, you know, get angry when they become, you know, dating, when they're dating, you know, and they'll shame them, men and women, about sex. I don't know what it is with narcissists, man. They've got a really twisted idea of what's healthy as far as sexual stuff is concerned. And they are all up into their kids' business about who they're dating, are they having sex, what are they doing, blah, blah, blah. As opposed to normal, here's the talk about the birds and the bees, please use protection, don't do anything stupid, you know, that kind of thing. It's, no, they want to know details. They want to, how dare you, how dare you be living with this girl and the person's in their late twenties. I'm like, what the frick? And mm, sorry, I just don't like them so much. <sighs> anyway. Okay. So that's, I hope that answered that part of the question. Let me get to the second part. Uh, it seems like female narcissists want to be cozy with men. Like they want to prove they still got it and see women as competition. A hundred and ten percent. 110%. Thank you so much, Heather. Yeah, 110%. So they've got mm, oftentimes daddy issues, oftentimes mommy issues, oftentimes both mommy and daddy issues. And so they, narcissists are all about the appearance, okay? They've got to be the best looking, the, the thinnest, the best looking, the curviest, the most attention, the you know, everything, everything is about appearance. Okay. This is why aging for narcissists terrifies them. So, um, because they don't want to think about dying. They can't, they can't imagine a world without them. Boy, I can. It's called B and B world living on the beach. Everybody lives on the beach and everybody owns a B and B. That's, that's my world. Wouldn't that be great? It'd be so much fun. Holy cow. Everybody be surfing and there'd be dogs everywhere. That's my personal fantasy. Anyway. So, um, they, they are in competition and they cannot stand aging. And when they see their daughter growing up and being beautiful, oh, it angers them to the core. I'll tell you a little personal story here. So my grandmother on my mother's side, narcissist like nobody's effing business. She was, there is not a kind word I can say about that woman. And I use the word woman loosely because she was a monster. Okay. So she moved in with us when I was 14. And when I was dating, she would spy on me when my boyfriend came over and she'd run back to my mother. Oh my God, they're kissing. All right, Bertha, I hate to break it to you. You dumb biatch. You can't get pregnant from kissing regardless of what you think. So, you know, she would, she would, and she had all these crazy ideas about sex and she would interfere and she would, you know, and, and then people wonder why I left the house at 17. I'm just like, because I can't stand you lunatics anymore. So, um, yeah, it's, they're, they're evil. They're just point blank evil and they're in competition. Oh, and that's the other thing she would say. Oh God, this used to drive me crazy. I'm sorry. I'm on a rant here. So what she would do is she would look at me. Because I was 14, you know, when you're 14, you look good. You know, it's like, it's so funny. I look back at pictures now of what I looked like when I was 14. And I was like, damn, I was cute. Why didn't I think that back then? Oh, well, because I had a grandmother and a father that were both telling me that I was ugly and fat and this, that, and the other thing. So, you know, she would look at me and she would get angry and she's like, oh, it must be nice to be young. I'm like, um, okay. Like I have anything to do with that. Um, yes. You know, I'm crazy, crazy. She was jealous because I was young. She, who does that? <laughs> Narcissists, psychopaths, yes. So yeah, they are angry when somebody has something they don't, okay? And this is something we talked about in Tampa. I swear to God, I'll shut up soon. I just I need to finish this thought. Um, so we, we were talking about aging and we were talking about looking in the mirror, okay? 
And because of the negative messages that a lot of us got, it's really hard to look in the mirror because we start going, oh, yeah, look at that line. And oh, oh, look at that. That I call this my WTF line. <laughs> that thing runs deep. Um, you know, it's like, and so we start looking at things like that and we start making ourselves wrong as opposed to going, huh, yes, I have a WTF line. I've got wrinkles here. I've got wrinkles here. You know, I, a life well lived. You know, <laughs> that's the way I look at it. So they've taught us that aging is a horrible thing. And they've taught us that we cannot be anything less than perfect. Why do you think the plastic surgery business is so huge, especially in Hollywood? So, you know, you've got to be young. You've got to be youthful. You've got to, no wrinkles, no fat, no, you know, blah, 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 blah. That's such a narcissistic thing. Okay. Age is a privilege denied to many. So when you look in the mirror, appreciate who you are. Appreciate this magnificent machine that has gotten you through life. This body, this face, it's amazing. You survived. You've survived to the point where you're watching this show. Congratulations, good job. Keep going. Do you see where I'm going with that? You love yourself 110%. Wrinkles and all gray hair and all, you know, and I was telling the, the ladies, you know, we were talking, I said, it's really funny. Once I let my hair go completely white, I never get hit on anymore, which I kind of like because I'm married. So, you know, but it's funny. It's like you turn gray and suddenly you're, you're, you're not seen. And I'm like, that's a good thing in a lot of ways for me, you know, but it's also indicative of the narcissistic culture that we live in, in that older people are disregarded or gray hair is disregarded, or wrinkles are thought of as something bad. And I'm just like, this frown line? Oh, I know where I got it from. It was all the crap I had to put up with when I was a kid. It was all the, what the, f you know? <laughs> I could laugh at it now. At the time, it was kind of like, oh, but you know what I mean? So mm. anyway, there that is. I'm sorry. I just rant. So they're terrified of aging. They're terrified of death. They are terrified. Like they're terrified of meeting their maker because a number one they think they are god and b number two there's a part of them that knows oh yeah oh yeah that's that's my one consolation is that there is a part of them that knows and i'm frankly they the terror that they feel at dying they deserve it they do so um that's why they don't like it when their partners age or want to go gray or want to go white or whatever because they don't want to remind it that they too are aging or when grandkids or kids are growing up and they're young oh well, how dare you how dare you be young how dare you be beautiful how dare you be because it's something they don't have they're lost they're idiots so if anyone is doing that get the hell away from them Seriously, if they're making your kids wrong for being young, get the hell away from them and keep them the hell away from your kids. That's all I got to say about that. That is the one thing. Well, there's two things. I told my mom when I was in high school to divorce dad. She wouldn't do it. Oh, no, the, the security, the security, the security. So she was willing to sacrifice us for financial security, right? And with my grandmother, she felt guilty. So she didn't want to have any of the other brothers look after her because she felt guilty because this woman, and I use the term loosely, instilled that fear, obligation, guilt. You owe me. I gave birth to you. You owe me. Even though she abandoned her when she was like 12 years old. Don't get me started. If you want to know more, I've got a book called What's Wrong With Your Dad. It really should have been called What Is Wrong With Your Entire Family. But there it is. What's Wrong With Your Dad available on Amazon. So anyway, there that is. Let me make sure I answered that question. Yep, they've got to prove it. They've got to prove they're still attractive. They've got to prove that they are still desirable and wanted and blah, 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 blah. So yeah, that's what they are doing. Okay, guys, I am done because I am done. I'm so done. I'm so done. I am going to go take a nap. Um, so next week, we are going to talk about doing the work alone, white knuckling it versus getting a therapist to help. And it's got to be a good therapist, cannot be a crappy therapist. Let's be clear. So we're going to talk about white knuckling versus therapy. So there that is. Oh, thank you so much. So um, that is that. Um, you guys have a great week. I'm going to be doing little canned answering questions I did not get to today. So I'm going to be posting those Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and that is that. If you have any uh, topics you'd like to see discussed in the Sunday show, go ahead and drop them down in the comments or 
let me know somehow. Um, and we're going to get the meet and greets together so that you guys have a better idea of where we're going to be and all the dates and all that sort of fun stuff. So, all right, guys, have a great week and drink plenty of water and get plenty of rest because I'm about to, and I will talk to you later. Bye.